we're we're told not to talk about yeah. these numbers. It was packaged not what the movie was. So total, we had about sixty-five thousand dollars worth of contracts. Yeah, so okay, it's okay. been three years. We yeah. have seen sixteen thousand dollars. Yes. <laughs> Tuna. Give us the log line to the film. What's it about? What's the genre? Wow, I haven't pitched that I mean, movie for a long <laughs> doesn't time. doesn't have to be a long line, but like, what's, no, no, no. what's the film about? Yeah, um, so the film is about um, um, a, young, a young boy that's coming back from college bringing his girlfriend to meet his dad and his brother. And his dad and his brother are quite estranged. And it's um, and the daughter, the, the, the new girlfriend brings them back together um, in a very not the way you would expect yeah it stars adam scott uh britney snow uh jk simmons and alex frost and what was the budget the budget was just sub right around a million and a half okay that sundance was a few months after the financial collapse of 2008 so right great fun it was super fun <laughs> so it yeah. wasn't it wasn't the best sundance in the history of sundance for sales I think there, there's definitely been articles since to r- reminding us that in 2009 it was like the worst Sundance on record for films being purchased. Right. But even in that mm-hmm. context, you expect, like even if it's a bad Sundance, it's still Sundance. Right. So, right. you know, you're excited and it was being well received and critically acclaimed and went, in, went on to get um, Spirit Award nominations. So then what happened? Uh, well, then it narrowed down to some sales agents that were going to help sell us some companies that approach us about releasing for like next to no money. Um, and what, what does next to no money mean? Like $25,000 yeah. for a million and a half dollar. Like yeah. that was when like things started to go like really bad. Yeah. You know, I understand everyone needs to be, get paid. Like sales agents just don't fly to those booths and they're for free. I get that. Like, but isn't but, that part of their cost of doing business just like us paying for the production as part of our cost of business? Like, why does their right. cost of business get absorbed first into the revenue and ours doesn't? That doesn't make any sense. No, 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 it doesn't. <laughs> In terms of transparency with data, this business, the film business, is a perfect breeding ground for unscrupulous people and the reason for that is there is no inherent value in a film you can't really look at a film and tell somebody what it's actually worth and it's very hard to look at a film and with any degree of uh you know approximate appraisal be able to tell somebody how much it costs to make it then when the film is done and they take it to market and if you're lucky you get into um, Sundance or one of the bigger festivals there are so many thieves in that space that it is it's just it's shocking and the reason why is because you now have this this film there's no standard it's not gold that trades for a certain amount it is worth whatever a buyer says it is within a particular market. In addition to all of this, when they go to market, there are so many side deals being made. For instance, I have a friend who is the distributor for Turkey. I go with my film, we have dinner. He says, I like these two films. Let's do a deal for both. And, and I say, okay, I want a hundred grand. You're going to paper it as 25 for film A, 25 for film B, and you're just going to hand me a check for 50 grand. That's not going to be tie tie either. I come back, I show you a contract. Hey, I sold Turkey. 
Here's your 25 grand. Okay, how much have you made domestically, do you think? Um, well, domestically, I mean, well, that's an interesting question. How much is the film made domestically? Um, I, I mean, our domestic partner has um, stopped giving us uh, reports, you know. So, and they <laughs> were purchased by another company. So now it's owned by a different distribution. Like, it's got a different name than the company it was with. I like the guys that we signed up with a great deal. But then when they took that film over, um, I, J.K. Simmons, for instance, won an Oscar. I was like, hey, how about you put it on, like, your homepage or something? Like, uh, they did a few things, like some small things. But I was like, can't you guys get it back on HBO or Showtime or, like, sell it to Netflix again or whatever it is that you need to like can't we see some more money from that and like uh, uh like nothing and now i'd like the rights to the film back which is something i'm pursuing for like the team not just me do you keep getting checks have you gotten checks during that period well they go to my producing partner's office so i mean i can ask him if he's gotten anything recently but nothing that i know of you know you can look at the numbers and it looks yeah. like it made more money right but, but but like it didn't like our investors are are not fully paid back. There's basically no way to verify any of this without extensive there, you, work. Yeah, I mean, you could, you can have audit rights in your contracts. You can have you know, these accounting rights. Then I can send off a letter and say, I'm demanding to see all these things. Well, 80%, maybe 90% of the time, depending on who's on the other side of that letter, they don't respond. And then if you file suit against the companies, you're generally spending good money after bad because most of these guys don't sit on cash. They're, they're, they're hustlers. Some of the companies, larger companies that went out of business that were in this space, some who took the library from, uh, they had, I think, thousands of titles. My clients had three of them or so. And when we pursued them, they went into bankruptcy, not because of our three titles. They had thousands of creditors chasing them, and I think I think over a hundred million dollars in in uh, in loans that they owed to their senior secured creditors. So when that happens, the client's film goes into the bankruptcy estate. They can't even get their own title back and the rights back. And what's so brutal about this process is. Not only are you not receiving reports telling you what your film has earned, and you're not receiving the revenue streams from any of those um, sales that are being generated, they're all going now into the bankrupt estate, into the hands of the United States trustee, who then has to uh, pay them out solely in accordance with the bankruptcy laws. So what happens is, banks and other financial institutions come in and all of the revenues from your film, from grandma's money, from Uncle Bob's money, from all the scratching and clawing is going to pay back a bank somewhere and you get zero. And presumably this happens all of the time, right? Because these companies turn over so fast. It happens all the time. And how much typically, just ballpark here, would it cost a filmmaker to hire you to to see something like this through. I mean, it must be a lot of money. So to actually litigate it all the way to judgment, if the other side responds, which is a, a big if, um, it would cost over $100,000. If the film has enough potential revenues, then, it, then it's something I might look at and take on a contingency if I believe that the defendant is gonna stand their ground, be solvent, and not just fold and run into bankruptcy. the 
so therefore I would really like my investors to have their money back. Yeah. I say that the film is a victim of a hurricane because of the times, but then I do, and that might be the vicious kind specific journey. I have hope for it still in the future, but I don't, I don't believe that um, it's going well for other independent films now. Like, and it's my experience since um, that I felt really um, embarrassed by that, right? Like, like that you super failed, that everyone assumes the movie made a ton of money um, because it was on DVD shelves and it was in awards. Like, I mean, there, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that the movie makes its money back. So there will be filmmakers listening to this who will think, well, this is only this only happens with a small number of shady companies. I will be smart enough not to get into deals with those companies. Can you give us any sense of like what that's not really accurate because that's partially accurate. Meaning the big companies will report and will send you whatever's on that report will send you your share. But that doesn't mean that, that they're not hiding revenues as well. So what you really need is you need an experienced attorney who's familiar with the language, who knows how to modify that language to at least give you a fighting chance to increase your portion of the pie. Right. I mean, I can review a small sales company agreement and mark it up probably in an hour. Yeah. Although, as you say, that contractual stuff only covers you so far against the the other things we were talking about in terms of the companies turning over in terms of the the outright fraud not being paid right i mean yeah, I mean, yeah. look i mean you can ask anybody who's in the personal security business and they'll say look there's only so much i can do if somebody wants you dead they're going to shoot you right um you know it's like i, I right. you know we'll right. be there but right so it's the same thing i mean we can only go so far because so long as money touches the fingers touches their fingers before yours you're vulnerable so long as money touches their fingers before yours you're vulnerable um i really i want to throw up right now it's so horrible there needs to be statutory protection right and and there needs to be people that go to jail for the theft right i mean this is in many of these cases it's just out now theft right the idea that a quote unquote sales company, distribution company, um, can come in, take your film, tie up the rights, pay you nothing, report to you nothing, and no one really ever get held accountable is just, it's just so repugnant that even though it would actually cost what I said it would cost earlier, oftentimes I wind up taking things on for less because I'm angry. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I want, I want this all cleaned up. Thank you so much for your time. This was incredible. My pleasure, anytime. Okay. Um, we'll be in touch, and and thank you again. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh my God! There's no bottom to this pit. Stormy skies wash my sins away. Let the thunder roll, let the lightning strike until I'm clean again. Oh, moon shine bright behind the clouds, but don't you show your face till I'm clean by and by and I'm free from earthly trials till I'm. Again, after the rain. Oh, after the rain, when the clouds... This is Carbon Art Projector. Um, it's been here since the early 40s in the same spot. Rain is off of rain. I can face the coming days when I'm new again after the rain. When I come home, go to the west, to the east, or the mountain or it don't matter where I am, I won't be a happy man If those clouds just follow me 
Someone say I love the strong female characters, which we never get enough of. I watch a lot of rom-coms, so this was a quality rom-com. I really, really enjoyed it. By Me was wonderful. It touched on a lot of different topics that are close to my heart and in my life. I started them in 97, so it was hard to be a very tattooed, stretched, pierced female in 1997. People used to throw food at me. It brings me joy to see how the world's changed and how accessible and easy it is for everyone basically to modify themselves. We just created this women in film entity up in Arcata, California called Women in Collaborative Arts and we just hosted our first film salon. Jesus said he never spoke to me But I think the sky above for pouring down her holy love To save a wretch like me Oh, after the rain when the clouds roll away When my skin is soaked through with water When the night won't turn to day When the pain is awful great I'll be new again As a vampire king, uh, could, because there are communities all over the country, you know, there's a vampire scene here, and there's several courts in New York City. Right. What can you tell us about the uh, vampire scene in Austin? So the Vampire Court of Austin is one of the largest vampire communities in the United States, if not the world. Uh, we created a very different format than what was seen before. We started the modern court system for the vampire community about seven years ago. Before that, there were very few courts and they very much structured themselves on a monarchy basis. There was a lot of bowing and scraping, bend the knee, kiss the ring kind of thing. Same lots of that. And so that was not something that we were into and we decided to establish a system of democracy and create a modern court system for a modern vampire community. And in doing so, we, we created something that not only blossomed uh, the Austin community, but that we found all of these other communities across the U.S. and across the world started forming uh, this, the same type of thing, the same type of court format, using our laws and tenets uh, and, and putting it forward there, creating democratic societies. And uh, to this day, you know, Austin has, Austin has now kind of become, uh, you know, the new mecca of, of uh, the vampire. And we were really happy to see so many people really take that idea and run with it. And now you can, you can find more Austin, or more vampires anywhere, uh, in, in Austin than anywhere. And it's... You know, that's what I don't like about Santa Clara, right? <laughs> <laughs> All the goddamn vampires. <laughs> So if, if uh, somebody is interested in the vampire scene and they and they show up at one of your events in Austin, are they going to find sort of like a wall of people judging them or are they going to be welcomed? Are they going to find friendly people there? I can tell you that if you come to Austin, Texas, come out to one of my events, uh, Austin Vampire Ball, something like that, and uh, if you come out to one of uh, the events that we have, you will find the most uh, incredible, uh, welcoming, happy, friendly vampires that you've ever seen in your life. Uh, we are a very welcoming community to everyone, not just vampires, but to everyone. So there you have it, Austin vampires are friendly vampires. Friendly. See you there. Like the Sesame Street vampires.